today our great pleasure is to introduce you the right network coordinator center. Uh, and we have some kind of crash course with a duration of two and a half hours. And we will try to discuss two main topics, internet and uh, data analytics. Uh, Vahan will talk about the team and also about yeah, our race. Thank you. Thank you, it's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, we have a really good team that came here today to introduce you to some topics that might be of your interest. So, first of all, about our team. Um, my name is Van Hoxetjan, I'm an uh, external relations officer from Riot NCC. We have an ER team, external relations team, and I'm responsible for Central Asia and focuses. We have here Christian Deschel. Toysha, Toysha, Toysha. Toysha, it's all right. Okay, and Lee is Van. Yeah, okay. Van Christian. Christian is an assistant architect in uh, a tribe NCC, so he will be the main speaker. We have here Gabriel Ajabahia. He Hello. is uh, Armenian. <laughs> <laughs> he is also yes. from tribe NCC and he is working as an engineer at tribe. And we'll have also uh, Alex Semiaga, he is also external relations officer, technical advisor, responsible for Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia. We'll also have our local counterparts here, uh, people that were, that were engaged in at tribe NCC activities, and they are working with us, and they are, some of them are our fellows, some of them uh, have, has participated in that. In uh, TTT program, and we will talk about uh, that later how we can participate in our activities in the region and uh, in Europe itself. So, Christian. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> can I start? Welcome. Perfect. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to uh, come here with so many people and uh, listen to this presentation. Um, just some words about this presentation. Um, we started already since last week to give this uh, workshop with the idea to provide an uh, interest and uh, education in what the internet is about and also with a bit of a relationship to uh, data science which is a very popular topic at the moment. And the goal uh, for this uh, presentation is that uh, it is not only a, a, a monologue from my side, so I am not uh, want to talk all the time, but I also want to get some feedback from you. And in order to do that, I would like to know a bit more about you. And that brings us to the first topic, which is the introduction. So uh, as I understand it correctly, um, we are, have uh, here a lot of students from the American University of Armenia and from different fields, right? Is that true? Yeah. Yes. All right. So we did um, the same uh, workshop on uh, Saturday. It was Saturday, right? Yes. yes. And no, it was better before, yeah. Then the, I'm not so. Yeah, try it again what you just did. Yeah. Perfect, Vahan. Perfect. So um, what I would like to hear a bit uh, is your background. Because the design goal of this uh, uh, workshop is that we're gonna uh, bring someone with basically zero knowledge about the internet up to speed for uh, the second part, which is more data science driven. So uh, to make that for you a good experience, I would like to understand what your background is. So if we have a lot of technical people in the audience, then of course we can um, go through the first part a bit faster and then focus on the second part. And to be honest, the second part is also more interesting, especially for me. <laughs> So, um, let me ask you, who of you is technical, has a technical background? So, show your hands. Okay. Um, with technical, uh, is it correct that we are talking about computer science? Okay. Uh, do we have some uh, math students here? Okay. Uh, hold on, did you raise your hands before? I mean, I consider that technical. No? no? All right. Okay. That's good. Well, sort of. Um, so we have uh, more than 60% non-technical people here, right? Yeah. And um, can you just quickly tell me uh, what 
uh, your backgrounds are. So I mean, right now, okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I, I know that's not comfortable, but uh, if the people that didn't raise their hands before could just uh, you know raise their hands and then quickly say what their uh, field of study is. So uh, what I would expect is uh, economics, um, law, um, political science, philosophy. philosophy, exactly, yeah, something like that. So you're done, okay, thank you. Um, do we have more people who would like to contribute? And it's only for your benefit, right? Because um, if I assume that you're very technical, you will um, not like the presentation. Political science, perfect, okay. Economics. Okay, cool. Do we have something else here? Design? Law. Law, okay. Do we have someone from design or? No. Industrial engineering. Industrial engineering? That's rather technical, right? All right. Let's not get hung up on definitions. So, um, to finish the uh, introduction, uh, let me quickly uh, talk a bit about uh, myself. Um, so I started to work in 2010 at the RIPE NCC. Um, I started in, in, in a department that was called Information Science uh, Systems. Uh, um, and the main focus was that we um, provide information to uh, our members. We will talk about um, our members a bit later. But after a year I joined uh, Research and Development. And um, there I do a lot with data. So my daily job is usually not giving presentations, but doing data. And um, I'm holding a, a, so I studied computer science. Um, that was my first study. And uh, last year I just finished my um, MBA in big data and uh, business analytics. And I tried to uh, get some of this knowledge also in this uh, presentation and to make it more interesting for you. Okay. Um, if I understand it correctly, we also have uh, two and a half hours. Um, who of you would mind if we, you know, go a little bit longer? So that would be possible. Because, I mean, I would like to uh, put a 10-minute break after the first hour. Then uh, we're going to go into the second part. And then we also have uh, local uh, contributions. Um, yes. Okay. Good. Then let's see. So we did the uh, introduction. Then uh, the first part consists of a brief history of the internet. Then we're going to learn how uh, TCP IP networks are working. Then we're going to uh, talk a bit about the DNS system. Um, then we cover internet governance. Um, going to talk about IoT, which is a very big buzzword at the moment. And then we're going to have a, a short uh, interactive session. And, um, then we will learn a bit about uh, RACI and the right fellowship. And then we are ready for the second part after the break. So uh, let's start with the uh, brief introduction uh, to the history of the internet. So this is not a full-blown course, uh, course about the history of the internet. For that, you should go to YouTube. Uh, it's a much a better source. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. Before we could develop uh, the internet, or before the internet was developed, uh, I think there are three um, uh, fundamental inventions uh, that took place. First of all, it's the electronic telegraph and uh, the telephone, of course. Uh, these two things are um, uh, connected over, over line, right? Um, they are also uh, line switched, in a way. And then we have the radio. And the radio is uh, specifically interesting because it's uh, for the first time that uh, data got transmitted wireless, right? And uh, nowadays, everything is uh, wireless, right? And then it took um, roughly more than 100 years uh, until the beginning of the, of the internet started in 1969. That's kind of the um, cornerstone when we talk about the development of the internet. This is a... Uh, very condensed uh, uh, overview of um, the different development steps and also applications on the internet. So um, you know that the internet was based on a, a research project which was called uh, ARPANET. And uh, that uh, was created out of a, a military uh, project uh, which was DARPA, the DFONS, Advanced Research Project, yeah, something like that. You can look that up. Um, 
Then uh, a very important step in the development of the internet was the invention of FTP and TCP IP and uh, Ethernet. Um, Ethernet in uh, then that sense is very important because when you're gonna connect your laptop at home, then the cable that you're gonna use is to 99% uh, Ethernet and that simplified the connectivity between uh, networks uh, significantly. And uh, just for your understanding, at that time there were actually a lot of uh, um, network technologies around, but uh, only TCP IP became the dominant standard and uh, I think that's why we have uh, such a, uh, see a, such a growing or the growth that we see, saw over the years of the internet because of its uh, simplicity. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Then uh, I'm not going to go into details about the uh, uh, different applications or uh, the different companies that got created over the years and uh, some of them don't exist anymore. Uh, for example, Nes Netscape. Um, I think it should just show that we are living in a very um, high-paced uh, uh, environment and the tech sector is moving very fast. When we're going to talk about uh, the internet and the impact on uh, our world, then I think there are four aspects very important. The first, the first one is the technology. The second one is operation and management of the internet. So that's separate of the technology. And uh, the RIPNCC, so uh, our organization, that would fall in the operation and management, but we're also going to talk about that a bit later. Then we have the impact on society and the commercial aspect of the internet. Um, I would um, think that the internet would not be at a stage at is, at it, as it is right now without the commercial aspect of the internet. I think if the internet would not have um, such a, a commercial um, effect, then uh, I think by now we would still uh, browse on uh, a speed of a, of a modem from, from the old days. This is also reflected in the growth of the uh, number of internet users and um, I think it's uh, important to, uh, to note that these numbers, um, they can never be accurate, right? These are all estimations, so um, don't get uh, too hung up on the numbers, but uh, I think the trend is important. And the trend is definitely that the number of internet users is growing and according to these statistics, at the moment we have 3.5 billion uh, internet users which if we're gonna compare that with the total number of uh, people in this world, then uh, it's roughly around 50% um, of the world population. That brings us to the next topic, uh, which is TCP IP. And uh, let me just ask you, how many of you, and right now I'm pointing more to the uh, technical students, know about TCP IP? All right, we have three people. So as I said before, um, the invention of TCP IP uh, enabled uh, this uh, huge growth of the internet. In a way, the uh, internet in itself is nothing else than uh, smaller networks connected, right? And they together form the so-called internet. And uh, TCP IP is the language that these networks talk with each other and uh, that makes it the internet because you can imagine if they are not talking the same language then it would not be possible to build such a huge network. Okay, so my drawing skills are not the best one. Um, that's why I ask if we have uh, some design students in the, in the audience. So, um, well, what's important here is that uh, I tried to um, sketch um, computers on the internet and um, there are obviously more computers on the internet but um, what I wanted to show with that is that in a, uh, in, um, to be able to communicate with each other every machine needs to have a unique number and I added that here. That also means that um, every device that is on the internet, for example your mobile phone, also has um, um, a unique number. If it does not have a unique number then uh, you will not be able to participate on the internet because then you see a lot of uh, errors. So um, 
Internet is about uh, sharing data, right? Uh, either you, um, you fetch data or you're going to send data somewhere. And to uh, show a simple transmission, and in this case I picked um, that uh, node number one, assume that uh, that is you, um, wants to send uh, or request a movie from Netflix. And in order to do that, it is uh, necessary that every node in this network knows all the other connections, right? And this is visualized in, um, well, I draw a book for that, um, which is called the rounding table. And I think right now I'm going to use the mouse to show you what I mean with that. So, um, compare the routing table with a phone book. And the phone book um, basically contains all the participants on the internet. If someone is not in this uh, phone book, then for this node, so for node number one, they are not existing. Hence, they can't be reached. And um, this is something that uh, in the second part of the course we will see in more details. But uh, in this example, um, we're going to see how the data would flow from node number one to node number three. Because in the routing table, we have uh, this ent entry saying like, if you want to send something to node number three, then they are connected via node number two, five, and four. Is that clear so far? Are there any questions so far? No? Okay, don't be shy. I mean, if there is uh, something that's not clear, please raise your hand and then um, we uh, try to solve it. So in that sense, um, node number one would send the data to node number two. Because what's also in the routing table is that uh, node number two is on the right side. And if we're going to assume that all of these nodes have something like the routing table, then you can assume that the data transfer will reach the destination. Then, to make this uh, a bit more realistic, I want to introduce um, so-called IP addresses. Because these simple numbers, they are uh, in reality not used, right? Because if we would have so simple numbers, that would just not scale with the number of nodes that we have on the internet. So, uh, smart engineers uh, back then introduced um, what's called IPv4. Um, I guess some of you already heard about uh, IPv4. Yes? So, um, what's the interesting thing about IPv4 is that um, it is an address space of 32 bits. And what you can address with 32 bits is 4.3 is billion IP addresses. So what does that mean? That means that um, for every node on the internet, if it, will, uh, if it has to be unique, we have 4.3 uh, possibilities, right? And this is a huge limiting factor. Because if you're going to go back to the slide where I showed you the, the graph of internet users, how many internet users have you had there? It was 3.5 billion, yeah? And if you want to compare it with this number, then uh, this is uh, already very tight, right? Now assume that uh, you don't have only one device that is on the internet, like you have your mobile phone, you have your laptop, you have your TV, right? And uh, probably other things that are connected to the, to the internet. So that means that if we're going to have 3.5 billion internet users, then you have to multiply it with the number of devices they have, and then 4.3 billion is definitely not enough. And this is at the moment a challenge that the entire internet community is uh, trying to, do, to resolve. Uh, so all the uh, internet organizations. And uh, it is termed as IPv6, uh, IPv4 depletion. That basically means that we're running out of IPv4 addresses. So what can we do to solve that? Any ideas? Come again? Perfect, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, by the way, Wahan, yep. do we have uh, presents that we can give uh, away for um, very good students? You can just uh, choose who will, get, uh, who will get it and who will write it. All right, Gabriel, can you do me the, the favor and note down the 
special students. Okay, perfect. Yeah, well, that's what happened. Um, around 25 years ago, uh, engineers um, started to create a new uh, version, which is IPv6. And right now you all ask, what happened to IPv5, right? You do that, right? Okay, yeah. Anyway, so uh, that was the experiment. And um, that's why we have this jump from IPv4 to IPv6. And that has 128 bits. So right now, if you're good in, uh, 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 well, if you can do math in your head very well, then um, the top number was 2 to the power of 32. The lower one is 2 to the power of 128. And as we all know, that is that one, right? Um, it's a huge number. Um, and um, I think with this number, it is possible to address every cubic centimeter of the Earth um, and that's, yeah, that's a, a very um, big address space. And I got uh, a question in the previous uh, workshops that um, if, if we run risk to run out again, we don't really know. Um, so there's one difference between IPv4 and IPv6. At home, you have one IPv4 address. Uh, so if you're going to talk with your internet service provider, and that could be, for example, Beeline or what is another internet service provider in I mean, you come, yes. And um, with IPv6, so if your internet service provider uh, has IPv6, then you don't get only one IP address, but you get a slash uh, 64. That means you get an address space of 2 to the power of uh, 56 or 64, which is bigger than the internet on IP4 at, uh, IPv4 at this moment. So theoretically, if you're really crazy and geeky, then you can have um, more than 4.3 billion internet devices just in your home, right? I mean, this sounds really awesome, I would say. Okay, um, there is one thing that uh, we have to, to note to that. Um, we can't switch to IPv6 uh, before everyone on the internet moved to IPv6. So the problem with these two protocols, they are not compatible. So that means that um, we first need to um, switch every device that's right now on IPv4 to IPv6, and then we can remove IPv4, right? And uh, I show you right now a graph, and uh, this is the traffic analysis of um, Google, and it shows how many percentage of users coming to Google have IPv6. And still remember, if that's not 100%, we will still have to maintain IPv4. And at this moment, um, we have 22%. Um, I mean, you see that the, that the trend is growing. But I also said that IPv6 is 25 years old, right? And um, so we, we, so the internet community is very unhappy with the uptake of IPv6. And um, yeah, I hope that um, in the next few years, we will be able to switch to IPv6, because if we don't do that, um, we might run into many problems. Because um, I said before, 50% of the world population is using the internet. That means that there's still a lot of uh, uh, space to grow, right? Another 50%. And then we are completely running out uh, of IPv4 addresses. And just to give you an idea what that means, if we don't have enough IP addresses, that means that um, uh, usually uh, a company is coming to the right CC and ask for IPv4 addresses, then we're going to give them IPv4 addresses if we still have one, and then they can connect you at home to uh, the internet. If we run out of IPv4 address, then the company can come to us and we're going to say, yeah, sorry, um, we don't have any more. That means that you don't have internet at home, right? So this is a very important uh, point. And the last... Um, term that I want to introduce is autonomous systems. Uh, as I said before, the internet is a network of smaller networks interconnected and uh, we usually have a name for these smaller networks and they are called uh, autonomous systems. And to be able to refer to them, we're gonna give them an, uh, a number, so AS1, AS2, AS3. And at this moment on the internet there are 52,000 of these uh, smaller networks. Okay, then uh, this is just a graph that I showed before with the proper uh, terms. So I put IPv4 addresses in there, 
and I gave them ASN numbers. Then let me just check how we are with time because um, I'm willing to sacrifice that. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I, I tried to mark the um, slides that are a bit more technical um, with a T plus. So if you don't get that um, for the first time that you hear the presentation, at the third time you should get it. <laughs> um, then it doesn't matter, right? Um, because it could be a bit more uh, complex. So TCP IP, uh, I said that's the language that these computers on the internet talk. And uh, what's very uh, interesting is that, uh, that um, whenever you're gonna send data from one machine to another, so basically you at home from your mobile device to Netflix, then the data uh, travels uh, horizontally, but on, the, on your mobile phone and on the server of Netflix, it travels vertical. And these are the so-called uh, IP stack. And um, the interesting thing about that is that every layer abstracts a certain uh, problem to solve, right? So first of all, we have the link layer that takes care of the physical element, how the, how the data travels. Because the internet is a network of interconnected networks and how these networks are connected with each other is basically irrelevant. Right? That could be copper, that could be uh, fiber, that could be satellite. And uh, you might laugh, but it could even be pigeons or, you know, it could be a truck that just carries data from one location to the next. Related to the standard, it does not matter as long as it fulfills certain requirements. Then on the uh, second layer, we have the internet layer that makes sure that uh, data travels from one IP address to the next one. Then we have the transport layer that makes sure that uh, the data arrives safe or not. Um, I'm gonna get in, uh, to that into, um, in, in the next slides. And then last but not least, we have the application layer where basically it could be your browser, it could be the client of Netflix that takes the data that's coming from the lower layers and either shows it as a web page or a movie or a, a document or a blog or whatever, or music, right? And then on the other side, this data travels these layers up again. And then uh, the application, uh, in this sense, the uh, Netflix application knows what you want to watch, right? And the interesting thing about that is that um, because of these layers, um, do we have any software developers in the, in the audience? Software developers? Uh, the computer scientists, they wrote something, right? Yeah, basic program, doesn't matter. Um, so you can sit here and you can create an application and when you write code, you can assume that you don't have to take care of these uh, things because someone else took care of that. And that's the huge benefit. So that means that you can write internet applications without you know, going into details about uh, that stuff. And that of course accelerates um, innovation. Okay. As I said, data on the um, client goes down and on the server it goes up. Then uh, the next one is um, the transport layer. I said that uh, there are two different um, ways on how to transfer data. One is TCP, which is the transfer control protocol, and the other one is UDP, is the universal data protocol. And basically it just means the difference between TCP and UDP is the one is connection oriented and the other one is connection less. What that means is if you choose as a software developer to connect to a service with, via TCP IP, then it means that the data that you send will arrive on the other side and you get a confirmation on that or you get a confirmation that it does not arrive, right? And the other one is UDP, that is fire and forget. You're going to send something and you don't know if it is received or not. And that's a price. Gabriel, listen. listen. Um, can you give me an example of an application where UDP is being used? Subscribe. Yes, perfect. All right. Um, Gabriel, remember? Over there. Okay, good. So the, the thing is that um, 
TCP is very verbose, and I'm going to get in that on the next slide. And UDP is uh, used for something that needs to work very fast, but you don't have a guarantee of the data if the data arrives or not. Every one of you had a Skype call um, where you know either the sound goes very robotic or the picture distorts. That is because of UDP, because there is no guarantee that the data arrives. And if half of the data only arrives, then uh, Skype or the uh, application needs to make something out of that. And that could be sometimes very funny uh, visualizations. Then, um, and this is the last technical slide for the first part. No, maybe not. I don't know. Um, this is called the TCP three-way handshake. So whenever you're going to do a connection via TCP uh, to another machine, then the client and the server go through these three steps before they're going to send data. And um, to visualize that a bit, uh, I included a, a joke. Um, and you know the joke already, right? No? no. Okay, all right. Um, then it's worth to, to, um, to um, uh, repeat it. So, as I said, uh, TCP IP is very verbose. And right now I would like to have someone from the audience to help me read it. Yeah? Gabriel Price, okay? Wait a second. Yeah. Yes. Um, would you help me? Okay, no problem. Okay, good. So, I'm um, um, I, I gonna do the intro and you're gonna do the, the other guy, okay? So, exactly. So I'm gonna say, and remember, I'm, I'm the client and you're the server, right? Then I'm gonna say, do you want to hear a joke about TCP IP? Are you ready to hear a joke about TCP IP? I'm ready to hear the joke about TCP IP. Here is the joke about TCP IP. Did you receive the joke about TCP IP? I received the joke about TCP IP. Excellent. You have received the joke about TCP IP. Goodbye. So it basically means that it's very verbose. And um, when uh, that person um, posted this joke, he said, like, I don't care if you get it or not. And that's a hint for UDP, because as we said before, fire and forget. So you don't care if the data is received. All right. If you're going to study computer science, those jokes are funny. OK, then the next one is um, the domain name system. Um, who of you know about the domain name system, DNS? OK, good, good. So. Um, we talked before about these numbers, and uh, we said IPv4 is that long, and IPv6 is that long, right? If you want to connect to any of these services, um, you would have to know these numbers, right? But um, since that's not very uh, um, feasible, unless you have autism or something like that, um, we have something that helps you to remember these numbers. Basically, you don't have to remember these numbers, but you can use uh, the so-called domain names, right? And um, the domain name system just resolves or translates a name to a number, right? As simple as that. So if you're going to type in www.netflix.com under the hood, it will be resolved to either an IPv4 address or an IPv6 address. And that basically makes it a very uh, important part of the internet. Right now, uh, are there any questions? No? OK, good. Um, from a technical perspective, uh, this one is uh, decentralized and hierarchical, um, which I will explain on the next slides. So uh, here again, we're going to go back to uh, the uh, drawing and we added the domain names and each of these domain names will be translated by the DNS system to the appropriate number. Then I said that it's hierarchical and uh, it's decentralized and that means that um, the operation of all these uh, different parts of DNS is done by someone else, right? And that makes it possible that um, if you're going to register a domain, has anyone ever registered a domain? 
Okay, that's already uh, more. So if you want to have your own web page, then you need to create uh, something that is around here, right? And the tree of uh, DNS um, is structured like that, that you're going to start from the front and then you're going to go back. And www dot is just the part that refers to uh, the web server that hosts your um, web page, right? And this is kind of standard, right? It, uh, you could use basically everything there. You could name it um, Gabriel1, right? Gabriel1.write.net. It does not matter. But I think most of us got used to www, and we expect a web page behind that, right? So um, let's look how um, a resolution, so basically a name to a number, how that would work um, systematically. And um, again, we have you here as a client. Uh, let's say that's your mobile device. If you're going to type in www.yahoo.com, then first the domain name system will ask your local cache. So there's a small thing in your laptop or your mobile phone that will cache all these resolutions, so from name to number, for a certain time. And if it's not in there, or if it's the first time that you're going to go to this web page, then the following will happen. First of all, you're going to connect to the DNS server of your internet service provider. And right now, that's the university. When you're connected to the network of the university, the IT department, they are running a DNS server, among other things. And this DNS server um, would do the same, right? It looks into the cache. If it's there, then it will serve it directly to you. And then you can uh, basically um, skip this part. Um, and that could, for example, be if another student went to the same web page. So that means that uh, if a lot of students go to the same web page, then the entire thing loads much faster, right? But let's assume that uh, uh, nobody went to this web page and then the resolution starts from the back to the front. And the first one is COM, right? So uh, first you would uh, contact the root DNS server system that basically knows where all the top level domains are. And the last ending of a domain is called the top level domain. And then they would say, oh, you want to go to yahoo.com. Um, then they want to give you the, they're going to give you the IP address of this server, which knows about yahoo.com. And then um, you connect to them and they will contact you and will tell you what's the domain name server of Yahoo. And then finally that server will reply you with the answer and that's the IP address. So basically the DNS system um, from, a, from a helicopter point of view is very simple. You have a name and you want to have an IP address. How that's being done, that could vary in uh, sophistication. Okay, that brings me to the next part, which is internet governance. And um, yes, great. I wonder if uh, someone of you wants to talk about that a bit. But uh, we will, we will. just we fine, just to be reminded, let's keep that short because I really want to do the, the second part. Come, come, my friend. Mm. So uh, as I promised, as I promised, we have here Alex and Yaka that will talk about some of the slides, so uh, we'll try to keep it shorter. Okay. Uh, I cool this. It is complicated. Yeah, that you can read at least something. Uh, actually, usual question. Is uh, how to manage so complicated, sophisticated system as yes. internet. Who runs it?
play its own role. And actually, the stakeholder is an important role because for, uh, for the processes in internet, we usually use the term multi-stakeholder and multi-stakeholder approach, which means that we have a lot of different players who are involved in this process. And uh, they act together to, 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 to gain some decisions and to uh, develop uh, the system a little bit. So, uh, we talked about IP addresses, talked about uh, DNS, uh, DNS systems, so domain names, and there are two basic resources in the internet. Uh, which are managed in different ways. But uh, in both cases, we have one uh, very simple demand. Uh, same name, same address, should be used only by one part. It's like postal address. If you have your postal address, you don't, uh, you don't want it to be duplicated in some other place. So it should be unique of the whole world. Same demand we have for IP address, same demand we have for the uh, main thing. So it's important to ensure that uh, these things are unique. So we have to have some top level organization who is responsible for this uniqueness. And yes, this organization was formed uh, 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 about 30 years ago, and it's called ICAP. Here we go with, uh, on the slide. Uh, I'm really not sure that any of you can, can, can read that, but it's ICAP. Actually, I, I can just add a bit that so this slide is uh, especially good here to understand that it is complicated. You cannot read all of this and you cannot, if you see the here, there are a lot of people and organizations. We cannot go through all these people and organizations and nobody goes the internet and everybody goes that. That is the issue. But uh, I can. This is not the organization which makes you know some specific decisions. Who will use this address? Who will use this name? Or something like that. No, it's very. Uh, it's no? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, this, uh, this, is, this is the organization who you know uh, make very really top level job. And it just distributes uh, names and addresses for large entities called registers, both for domain names and for just get it. But uh, uh, I will not uh, describe too much about um, domain names uh, because three five seven uh, I will concentrate on uh, IP addresses. So, <clears throat> basically the system is like this. ICANN has global pool of IP address, of free IP addresses. That's important. They have only free IP addresses. And they distribute their most free IP addresses for five parts of the world. Uh, can you switch to the map? Yes. And this one? Yeah. And there are five so-called regional internet registry. And they wrote corresponsible each for uh, its own geographical region. It's area, American registry for internet numbers, Latinic, obviously that's Latin America, uh, Africanic. The youngest one, Haitianic, uh, 
which is responsible for uh, Asia Pacific region and Australia, and Rye PCC, which is responsible for this large geographical region, consists of uh, 76 countries. So this is the largest area, and we represent exactly this organization. How things uh, work? Uh, how things work? Further. Yes, Red MCC obtains addresses from ICANN and then distributes uh, distributes over so-called MIR. ICANN is regional, maybe uh, 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 regional interface. And it distributes addresses or local like uh, sorry, local interests. And those parties are members of Red NCC and this is important that how it grows. I mean that <clears throat> it's not Red NCC who uh, manages uh, those organizations who create some artificial rules and tell what's right and what's wrong. No. Uh, my no. No. Uh, our members, uh, 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 local uh, implementers are our members. And uh, from the how many do point we have of now? view of what the law, 17 or 18 already? They uh, they are calling us. Yeah. Okay. They decide what the rules will be. This is very important. All uh, rules concerning organization, administration, and money issues, all those rules are created by, by our members. We are organization who deploy, deploy uh, those rules. We do not invent, invent them. We just deploy them. This is very important. So this large community and this number is outdated now. It's 18,000. 18,000 members. They decide which rules will be applied for our region 76 countries. And of course, we have members from Armenia as well. And the Armenian members are deciding as well. But um, this is only one part. I told if you, you know, if you were careful, uh, you noticed that I talked about organizational, administrative. We have asked for a presentation to put that there are materials. Okay. Say a word about technical questions. And that's one. Uh, uh, the proper uh, project committee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. That's what's wrong. Non profit organization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but Support yeah. that committee. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have this group. What does it mean? And that in parallel to the organization, right NCC, which is non-governmental association, registered in Netherlands, and so on, so on, so on, is back in town with a managing director, which is Axel Fowler right now, and so on. They also have so-called right community. And right community is formed from, uh, from people, not from organization. It's formed from person, persons, from, you know, uh, from humans. Our right NCC is us, and right community is you. Every one of you can join your community just by registering uh, in one of mailing list and it's free 
it's completely open, no any obstacle, no exams or something. Anybody who is interested in the topic can, can join me on the list and start working immediately. And this is right community in form of several working groups which decides what technical rules will be. And we will be partners. We'll deploy those technical rules. That's how things work. So there are two parts, two, two kinds of community. One community is community of organization, LARs. Basically, uh, half of them are uh, internet operators, but uh, about 30 percent I believe right now uh, that's large, uh, large companies like large enterprises. So it's not only about ISPs, that's a whole uh, bunch of stakeholders. And second kind of community, that's community of personal, uh, of persons, of individuals who are deciding which technical policy should be developed, how they should be developed, and who develop those technical policy. And that's why we have this, this word in our official registration documents. Mm -hmm. And that means that we, 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 are, we are more than just an uh, uh, organization who is responsible for distributing IP addresses. That's community who told us, no, please do some, some additional resources. Uh, so, 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 sorry, so some additional projects. You want to, 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 to have some, some pros of the world. It was a decision of community. Now we have a Patas project, and uh, Christian will... will I will cover that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will cover that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. a bit later. But it was a decision by community, not by us. Or we do, have, uh, we, we, we do want to, to, to have resource certification, okay? We started that project and we, 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 we completed it. So now community has this uh, certification that was decision by community. And so on. All, all, all those things are uh, performed according to the will of the community. So when we are talking about internet governance, it's very important to understand that modern internet it's not uh, ruled by some special party, special organization, or something. It's ruled by basically everybody. And uh, there are a lot of interests. And there is a system to take down all of those interests and it, you know, produce some, you know, the best big result for all of them. So, probably that's it for now. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you much. So actually, uh, Alex has uh, told us about RIPE and CC and um, RIPE community itself. Uh, we have a lot of other organizations, as you have seen from that first slide. And some of these organizations, just not to go and describe all of them, some of these organizations are called something like you know, I star, mm -hmm. and star mm -hmm. organizations and they are implementing different, different, different functions and all of you, depending on what is your interest and be involved in these ISTAR organizations you can take this presentation uh, and go through all these uh, organizations after you can, it's about ICANN, IANA, ASO, etc. ISO also, ISO has also a uh, very important function here uh, in our community uh, IATF Internet Engineering Task Force that has uh, also meetings and it is implementing and designing the uh, standards. Um, so, you can take it afterwards and just go through all this presentation uh, that part through all these ISTAR organizations. But, we will uh, be more... Uh, 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 yeah? Uh -huh. 
So, uh, we will uh, be more concentrated on technical issues. So, how IoT changed the internet? I guess you have heard about IoT, right? Internet of Things. How it will change? Yes. Okay. Um, by the way, do you hear me? Because sometimes I have the feeling that the microphone is not uh, proper. Just okay. okay, perfect. Very good. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, contribution. Um, so right now, how do I get your attention back? Um, we were talking about IoT. So you all, yeah, okay, maybe you don't know about uh, IoT, but um, IoT is... Um, as with many buzzwords, right, like cloud and what else, uh, big data, machine learning and all that stuff, um, it's nothing new, right? But it has, um, it, dis it describes a certain uh, situation. So since we already said that we have a lot of people on the internet and everyone has um, mobile devices, we get more and more of these devices on the internet. And that is kind of going in the direction of what Internet of Things is. So uh, it kind of describes that the Internet is not uh, just on our laptop, but it's around us. And um, I think we're going to have later on a presentation that goes directly into IoT and describes that in more details. But what I would like to um, talk about right now is some use cases. And um, for that, I picked out a company and this company provides uh, sensors. And sensors is um, kind of the, the foundation of uh, Internet of Things. I mean, imagine that you have sensors all around you. And uh, all of these sensors, to make it possible that we have these sensors, I mean, you would not uh, take a laptop and uh, install it on, uh, on your wall just to measure the temperature. They have every, uh, they have uh, four parts uh, in common. First of all, they are small, right? Uh, the computers are getting smaller and smaller. Then they are getting cheaper. And then they don't use a lot of uh, battery. And that um, basically enables a lot of different use cases. And um, I just want to read you um, the list of use cases that this company, Libellium, has on their portfolio. And with a lot of uh, buzzwords, um, you need to also work on the PR uh, side, right? So the people studying um, uh, business, they know that. Uh, and then you don't have agriculture, but you have smart agriculture. You don't have animal farming, but you have smart animal farming. You have smart cities, you have smart envi environment, you have smart water, you have smart metering, you have smart security, and so on. And um, if we're gonna pick out one of the use cases, then um, I think last time I talked about wildfires, right? I think I'm gonna do that again. So, um, because uh, wildfires are a problem in Armenia, as I heard, right? Is that true? So, you know, no? Okay, thank you very much. Or otherwise, just provide me with another problem and we try to solve it with IoT. So the thing is that right now you have a huge uh, forest and uh, the problem with wildfires is that you uh, notice them when almost uh, half of the forest is already burned down, right? So what you want to achieve is you want to uh, identify that there is a fire starting as soon as possible, right? So what can you do? You can develop these sensors, smart, um, uh, smart sensors that are small, that don't use a lot of energy and they are super cheap, right? Then you're gonna fly with a helicopter or with a plane over the forest and you just distribute a lot of these sensors, right? What would help next? Um, so it's summer, uh, either someone forgets a cigarette in the forest or, you know, it gets very warm there. And then suddenly uh, a flame starts, right? And then it starts to grow bigger and bigger and then a sensor uh, notices that there is the uh, increase in temperature, right? And this information could be sent to uh, the firefighter central uh, immediately and they know, hey, there is uh, a fire starting. And then the fire is still small and they can fight it with uh, two people, right? I mean, this is much easier as if you have already half of the forest burning. And it is going in this direction. So um, you will see in the next few years that 
a lot of things around you will get smarter. Could be the fridge, could be the toaster, could be the coffee machine, and so on. But this, yes, yeah. Uh, if one of these sensors stops working, the whole system will continue to work. Or they yes, are yes, yeah, yeah. So it is basically a micro-internet, and as we said, the internet is uh, decentralized, right? I mean, that's from the history that you know it was created to withstand a nuclear uh, strike. So you're going to take out one node, then the system will reconfigure itself, and everything will be still fine. It's with IoT the same, so it's uh, decentralized. You can destroy one sensor, it doesn't really matter, in a way. But there's one thing that uh, is important with IoT, or at least at this moment, and uh, I would say that it's as important as the, sw that, as the move to IPv6, right? Because if we don't move to IPv6, you will not have internet. Um, this problem is uh, similar uh, important, and, and what we can do is uh, we can give out a prize for the person that guesses it. I mean, you're of course exempt, right? Um, so we said that uh, IoT has these uh, three traits. It's small, uh, it's cheap, and it doesn't use a lot of bat battery. What could be a fourth one? So what do you think Time. is... Come again? Time. Time. Yeah, you study philosophy, that's why you're uh, going to uh, say time. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, aspect, but it is not uh, what we were uh, looking for. So you have 50% chance for the next uh, prize. So what do you think could it be? Now, no, of course you can't say it, right? I mean, that would destroy the entire fun, right? So please. Maybe security. Absolutely. Oh, that is, you know, sometimes... I'm surprised. You study computer science, right? Um, yes, data science and also multiple. Okay, interesting, cool. Data science. Mm -hmm. Data science, you said. Yes. Cool, then the next part of the presentation will be very interesting for you. Anyway, so um, the, the problem with IoT is uh, security. Because, um, uh, because they are produced very cheap, um, security is, um, is not really on their list from the producers, right? So um, you might have heard about that last year. There was a, a, a DDoS. You know what a DDoS is. I know you know what a DDoS is, but uh, the rest. Can you shortly describe what a DDoS is? It's distributed dog attack, which is the same as sending packets of data to crash the whole server or the system. Yes. Perfect. So basically, um, in uh, simpler words, uh, you have a service like Netflix, and uh, Netflix sees per day 1,000 users, and suddenly 100,000 users try to access this service, and then Netflix can't handle that anymore. And then nobody can access Netflix anymore, right? And that basically happened. Um, yeah, I need uh, some activity anyway. So. Um, that happened last year um, with uh, Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, with Facebook and Twitter. Um, so there was a, a day um, when on the East Coast first, uh, Facebook and Twitter didn't work anymore and then on the West Coast. And uh, that was for a couple of hours. And you can imagine that uh, Facebook makes a lot of money with so many people on uh, Facebook with advertisement, right? Um, and if they are not available for two or three hours, then we're talking about of millions of money, uh, dollars that are being lost. And um, that DDoS attack uh, was originated by uh, these home, uh, so smart home devices. So your surveillance camera, if you're going to buy it, and if you are unfortunate, they have the same password on every device that's being bought, the default password. And uh, as a responsible user of these devices, you're not going to change the password, right? So you just install it. Okay, that was right now a joke. You should change the password. But a lot of people did not do that, right? So what uh, hackers did, they just scanned the internet um, for these devices, and then they tried to uh, uh, hack it, right? So they were in control of that. I mean, it is bad that they're going to see what you're going to do at home without you knowing that but uh, it was also very uh, bad that they could control a network of millions of these uh, devices and they could orchestrate an attack against uh, Dyn, which is a DNS provider, which uh, provides Facebook and Twitter with DNS resolutions, right? As we had before. 
and they destroy this so for a couple of hours. So that means that DNS, what we learned before, was not working for Facebook and Twitter. And hence, it could not be read because nobody remembered the IP addresses, right? So that was the problem. Um, and then, I think we can go to the interactive session. Um, we are running already 10 minutes over. Uh, I would suggest that we're gonna do that five minutes and uh, Vahan will tell us about RACI and uh, the right fellowship in the next block because then we have an easy start. Uh, so we do that right now. Uh, I expect a bit of um, feedback from you, so participation. And then um, we deserve all a coffee break. Okay? Good. So, as you all know, the internet um, changed a lot of things, right? And I give you some examples. Uh, Google um, changed the way we search information, right? Before, uh, if you want to look up things that you didn't know, you had to go to a library, right? And with Google, right now you can do that at home and much better than at a library, right? Then we have WhatsApp, which changed the way we're going to communicate. So group chats, that was not possible um, before uh, WhatsApp was there, right? Or sharing images or coordinating meetings. Another thing is Google Maps. That definitely changed the way we uh, navigate, right? You're gonna get to a new city, you have no clue um, where to go, you just use Google Maps and it will suggest you which restaurant uh, you can go to. We did that also yesterday uh, when we tried to explore the nightlife. Um, apparently Sunday is not a good day for uh, exploring the nightlife. Um, anyway, then uh, relevant to the university, Coursera is changing the way we, um, we, we learn and we study. And I also experienced that uh, last year when uh, I was studying, um, because many of the content that we learned uh, was via Coursera. Um, back then we had, um, well, proclaimed the best uh, machine learning expert of the Netherlands, um, who was our teacher. And he's a brilliant researcher, but as a teacher, he was really bad. So um, what we did instead, following his lecture, we just went to Coursera and we followed the machine learning course from uh, Andrew NG, which is a really, I can recommend that if you want to learn about machine learning. Um, and I think that in future, every university needs to uh, think about how they're gonna deal with this channel challenge of online courses because otherwise uh, I think they will go uh, over time because the uh, benefits of online courses is much higher. Then we have two uh, local examples, uh, menu.armenia uh, and Gigi. So right now I would like to know from you as a starter um, what kind of applications do you use regularly and uh, what applications you can't live without anymore. And then maybe if you wanna, um, well, if we wanna challenge that, um, I would like to hear from you what you think will be the next big change on the internet or technology in general. And we're gonna give up prizes for that, of course. So you can um, be very active in that. Yes, please. Oh, you already got a prize. You are greedy. No, I'm kidding, please. Oh, do you want a microphone? No. No, are you sure? Yeah. It feels very good. I think I heard that from um, the other. Oh, yeah, in Chamut, right? Jamuk, yeah. Uh, is that something where you can put a, a math formula and then it resolves it? No, it's... Because that's, that I would call that cheating, but... No, 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 it's not. It's like an interactive app and it, it gives you, like, this topic, like, it gives you, like, you choose trigonometry yeah. and it gives you, like, some, like, problems that you can solve and get, like, better. Okay, then it's going in the direction of Coursera, right? So that it will help you uh, uh, learning. Okay, interesting, interesting, yeah. And it's called Yeah, yeah. 
tonight if you know we are completely bored then we're gonna check out that app um, yeah Mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, two-dimensional, also three, four-dimensional graphs. And it is quite amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, a lot of you are using those apps, right? Okay, this is all related to education. Is there something that, you know, would not fit in this? Yes, please. Mobile banking? Mobile banking, yes. Um, that is true, yeah. yeah. Do you think... Do you think that banks, uh, so brick and mortar banks, will be obsolete in the in the future? No. no? Why not? I think blockchain will change. Ooh, that's a, ooh, that's that's a, a very hot topic. We're gonna talk about that in the in the interactive session in the second part. And uh, yeah, blockchain is. Um, I personally think the blockchain. Um, would would you think that blockchain uh, is a threat for banking? Mm -hmm. Some, uh, maybe some services will be uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think that? Do you, uh, do you think because Bitcoin it's is... much cheaper and it's um, more secure and many other reasons. There is no third party mm -hmm. um, for transactions, uh, for uh, paying or other mm -hmm. Where do we have the economic uh, students in the, in the uh, room? Actually, I'm a financier. Okay. Um, but um, after graduating, yeah. um, I now study. I'm autodidact. Yeah. But I now study um, lead science. All right, then I'm going to challenge you directly. Um, it will get cheaper, that's for sure, because uh, bit, uh, blockchain technology is a decentralized public ledger. Um, you know what a ledger is? You know that, right? So um, you have a business and uh, you need to keep what's coming in, what's going out, right? Because otherwise the text office will have a, uh, a talk with you. Um, and that's a ledger, right? That's basically a book that keeps the transactions um, both sides in a way. And um, a blockchain technology is considered as an electronic ledger, um, safe. Uh, I mean, it's safe against... Uh, tempering, so nobody can change something without uh, someone not seeing it, right? That's the benefit of uh, the blockchain. And um, I think that uh, banks will benefit from the blockchain instead of um, seeing it as a threat. Because at this moment, um, doing all these transactions uh, between various uh, customers is very in cost intensive, right? You have uh, systems that need to be uh, keeping copies of what happened because, I mean, data loss is possible with uh, computer systems. And losing this data is not a good idea at all because, I mean, if you're going to look at your savings account and they're going to come to you and text you, hey, sorry, we don't really know what you had on your saving account, so let's start from zero again, right? Um, that is not good. But with the blockchain, they uh, can have that uh, in a public space. So they have a ledger, so a database where they're going to write down, oh, you have that amount in your uh, saving account. But the interesting thing about the blockchain compared to other database technologies, you can just share this data with everyone because nobody can change it without noticing, right? And that will make um, the operation of banks much cheaper. And uh, you might have heard about uh, Ripple. I mean, there are 800, more than 800 of these cryptocurrencies. Every computer scientist or student that, you know, just is bored on a weekend, they're going to create a new cryptocurrency and then find someone who is stupid enough to buy it. Um, so Ripple is being backed by Google. Google is very much interested in that. And, uh, well, the, the idea is that Ripple will... Um, help banks to mm -hmm. keep all these transactions uh, coordinated. It could of course be that uh, Google will enter the market of, you know, uh, uh, fintech companies and um, in the long run you will not go to your bank anymore but Google will uh, manage uh, what you're gonna have in a way. 
Okay. Um, the price goes uh, to Christian. No, that's not true. Uh, um, so let me ask you, should we uh, go into a break? Yeah, yeah okay. So uh, Vahan, if I understand it correctly, um, we're going to meet in the cafeteria and for the ones that um, won a prize, they get coffee for free and uh, the rest as well, right? Yes, we can do that, yeah. but we, cannot, we, we have also have some prizes, so we can just award them with the prizes after the lunch, uh, after the coffee break, sorry. Okay, so uh, Vahan, what, what I suggested is that uh, right now we're going to have a break and then you're going to start with the, with the fellowship and with the racing program. Okay, okay. Okay? Okay, yeah, sure. All right, good. Do you want, guys, now to have a rest? 15 minutes? Uh, 10 good. minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes and we're coming back here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm presenting Shrek Technology. We are a local Armenian company and we are developing uh, IoT systems. Current active project that we are working is an uh, IoT system jointly with uh, uh, Physics Institute in Tugna, if you know about that. This is the stabilization system for uh, CERN, Switzerland. So I will talk about the uh, very quickly because most of you know what is IoT. What is the driving forces for IoT? Because it's, uh, sensor technology was developed very um, quickly for the last few years. This is because of uh, the self-driving cars. The self-driving cars was boost the technology, the silicon technology, the industry, and uh, a lot of investments were done in this area. So uh, this is the first thing as a driving force. The second is cheap uh, devices and miniaturizations of the devices. And then the low power design and low power devices, which is uh, the traditional, let's say, TTL logic, the 3.3 volt logic, replaced with 1.2. Now there are devices which are working on 0.1 volt. So the low voltage, low consumption, and uh, very um, small batteries allow this technology to grow up. The capability of mobile devices, this is the next generation 5G that is coming, which is creating a new environment because IoT systems will not work on 3G or 4G. Uh, one tower can um, serve only, let's say, a limited number of clients. Let's say 1,000 clients, you need dedicated 16 channels for mobile devices to serve it. But uh, for uh, mass sensor technologies and mass connectivities, you need uh, millions of connections. And one um, tower should support uh, 10,000, 100,000 parallel connectivities. This is coming with, our, uh, with 5G. Then the latency, one millisecond second of latency, this is uh, is requirement for this uh, kind of systems. And another thing is uh, the bandwidth. Uh, one uh, gigabit per second bandwidth is necessary for 5G. So these are all technologies that are driving forces and also the power of the cloud that is growing very high. These are some examples of the tiny and very cheap $1.2 of, you can get $1 even if you buy 100, let's say, each of these devices. And uh, the mobile ca capability, all these things, and uh, Google platform, Amazon Web Services, these cloud services are allowing you to uh, boost this technology very quickly. And uh, uh, connectivity communication is bringing a new way of communicating. The devices are becoming smart, not only uh, the traditional devices that we know, let's say the shoes, the table, chair, pad, anything can be connected, right? The first question could be why to connect it. Uh, you can have a homework to think about any, anything surrounding us. How, why to connect to internet? What kind of capability? What kind of sensors? What kind of application to uh, develop to make it connectivity, right? 
And the, the system is uh, required the scalability because you need to develop a system, not to customize every time, not to develop some system that is particular for this kind of product. You need to develop a system that is scalable. Easily you can scale up if uh, you change the application. Another thing is uh, security and privacy, because the traditional way of uh, security is not working. You are opening holes into the network, because these cheap devices, you cannot, the traditional way to uh, put firewalls or expensive devices or UTM devices, uh, threat management uh, systems, right, uh, to protect this system. This is uh, the uh, uh, advantage of these things is uh, that you are using a very cheap technology and you cannot go for the traditional method to protect from one single point of entry of your network. These are holes that you are opening the security holes into your network and you need to protect differently and your uh, local network which was a trusted zone in terms of networking this is becoming untrusted so anything is untrusted uh, the trusted zone, DMZ zone, uh, untrusted zone, all are untrusted and uh, this is the hype uh, by Gartner that you can see Internet of Things is in top this is uh, uh, 64 billion uh, devices will be registered in 2020 and uh, silicon industry, machine-to-machine uh, -machine learning, uh, communication and uh, big data, all these things are uh, uh, investing billions of dollars in this. And uh, where is the IoT is used? Everywhere. Any area that you may think of the facility, utility, energy sector, safety, security, uh, retail, business, banking industry, everything. So it's everywhere. And this is a, a nice slide about uh, the segmentation of different types of industrial sectors that uh, IoT is uh, uh, entering into. Um, this is the system flow, uh, data flow in IoT system, oh, sorry. Uh, where we are having, let's say, uh, controllers, microcontrollers. For example, in our case, we've been using ARM Cortex family products, let's say Linux-based uh, small microcontrollers, where you are connecting the sensors, and different types of sensors and actuators you are connecting to this uh, uh, embedded controller. This is small devices like a computer. And then uh, it is collecting the data or providing the API commands and then uh, collecting the data into the security gateway and through the gateway you are sending this data into the central server which we call cloud server and then uh, getting the commands from there like uh, uh, controlling the actuators that you are having to the So this is the overall system and this kind of system, if you deploy this kind of system if you have the firmware here, the sensors here, the sensors can be very different. They may work in different protocols, like IPOC, SPI, and anything, right? And then you have all the API demands. Uh, then this infrastructure you may deploy to any type of application. So that's we are, what we are calling the scalability. So once you develop this kind of system, you can adapt this for your own needs, right? These are some of the community, different types of uh, workshops and uh, 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 conferences that uh, are dealing with IoT system. And this is different types of machine-to-machine -machine communi communication, wireless sensors, IPv6, and Bluetooth, ZP, Wi-Fi, LTE, all these things. And uh, this is the technology that you are using, uh, the TCP IP layer, uh, then transport layer, then application layer, layer where you are using the REST API uh, to communicate with. There are also, if on HTTP level, you may have for now, there is a new protocol which is called NIPI. This is uh, on HTTP based protocol, you are communicating with the central server directly from the system without having any intermediary device or a gateway. 
and then IoT application, visualization systems, etc. And also big data, of course, on top of it. Um, these are devices and platforms and big data analysis. These are methodologies, some very simple, that when you are dealing with a uh, big amount of data collected by these sensors, uh, how to analyze them. And uh, also the technology challenges. You can see that the environment is different, resources, the sensor, these low-cost devices are different, uh, the variety of different types of devices and technologies, and this brings up to the main question of convergence. Everything is convert. Convert means uh, you have, um, let's say, sensor technology, embedded controllers, firmware development, software development, website development, big data analysis, uh, machine learning, all these things are coming together as a converged technology to deal with IoT. So to deal with IoT, you need to have so many different types of expertise so that you can have all this together to bring up the system in a working condition. And this uh, technology also brings some challenges. This violates single point of entry, open security holes, uh, low cost of it, and uh, in the meantime, you don't want to uh, bring up the um, price of your system. So that's why you need to rely on low uh, power of computation, low power of devices uh, in terms of power consumption, so that this system will be very scalable and you will uh, easily distribute thousands of sensors anywhere you can put because they are cheap. And then uh, convergence technology is brings all together because everything is about man, humanity, right? Man, currently, if you uh, calculate the bandwidth, what each of us bandwidth we consume. The bandwidth is uh, our consumption of sky, video, our telephone, our voice, Anything that we communicate, these are intermediary devices that is uh, fulfilling our desire to communicate. So uh, the final consumer is not this device, but the man itself. So we are convert this technology, is consuming a totality, in totality of some kind of uh, data bandwidth that is necessary for that particular person, depending what kind of all communication uh, surround us. And uh, this is IoT, big data, and cloud also is getting converted because these are all uh, distinct separate technologies. There are many companies that are working only in particular in cloud area, in big data area, in firmware development area. But now, to bring up the system, you need to deal with all of them. So this is the all overall convergence and uh, uh, I will skip this case study case because uh, Christian has gone through some cases. This is just smart city case, Madrid with uh, city environment and health system. Uh, this is Japanese and very smart village case. This is uh, Sahara. And uh, education. We are having this presentation because what well, one purpose? There are a lot of uh, opportunities in this area, and research interest, and if anyone will be interested in uh, research in IoT systems, um, we are welcome, you can contact us, and there are uh, many opportunities because it's a so different variety of interest. One could be an electrical engineer, work only in the area of sensor development, or sensor technology, or uh, embedded controller design, etc. Uh, another one could be a computer science specialist working on software development, another on web design, another on data analysis, etc. So uh, it's a, a growing uh, area. It will uh, blow in all over the world because this, uh, it, it's already a big blow has happened because of this. Mm, the self-driving car and this technology accumulated so much resources that it will be used in many many other areas as well and lastly I will talk about security 
there are several things. The confidentiality that uh, you need to maintain when you are developing the system. Uh, these are uh, possible attacks, cyber attacks. The theft of the service and the middle attack. Data integrity when your data is corrupted or not uh, uh, complete. And uh, the uh, tiny devices can be served as zombies uh, to easily uh, develop uh, uh, those attacks or DDoS attacks. Right? And uh, this is the cost of hacking, right? Anyone who is hacking the system, they can work in different areas. One is the communication attack. This is the most, most cheapest one because you need to write a code Etc. Software attack is more complicated where you are hacking the software system. And the hardware attack where you have to go into the hardware itself. And the hardware attack is most complicated where you can access, let's say, through JTAG interface, through the debugging interfaces, and uh, do something in the uh, hardware. So, uh, in conclusion, we just have an opportunity about IoT system development. You can contact us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any question, please? I think you just leave that. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that means that we are going back to uh, where we uh, stopped before and um, right now it's already 10 past 6. Um, all of you I think uh, know that it's a two and a half hour uh, workshop so uh, we started at four. So theoretically we have 20 minutes left. Um, I think we will uh, push it a little bit further so it will take a little bit longer. But we do all our best to make it uh, as short as possible and also as interesting as uh, possible. So you're going to have five minutes for uh, presenting RACI and the RIPE Fellowship. Actually, we have, uh, this, this part is quite interesting for you because this is the place where uh, there are possibilities to get involved in our system. So RACI is the Iran Academic Cooperation Initiative that we run with academic institutions so the participants from these institutions, both they can be both students, or researchers, academics, they can apply uh, if they have any researches for any work or interest in these areas, but not only limited. So it's network measurement and analysis, IPv6 deployment, vision routing, network security, internet governance, security, and interconnectivity and internet of things, but it is not limited, remember. Each and every topic that might be interesting for our uh, members and our community can be represented and can be applied. So you, you apply with your research and with your topic, and with RACI program, we can fund your complimentary tickets, travel, accommodation, and support your participation in our, our events. Uh, different events, it is RAD meeting that is twice a year, it is ENO, Eurasian Network Operators Group, MINO, Middle East Network Operators Group, and SEE, Southeast Europe meeting. So, uh, and RAD Fellowship is for anybody else. So, that is not academic, it can be something like even a police officer that has good ideas and good researches in, in his area. So, go ahead. And, um, the deadlines and the applications. So we have MINOG, it will this year it will be in Tehran. It will be 25, 26 April and application deadline is 25 February 2018. You are welcome to apply. Right meeting uh, will be in Marcel for March deadline and it will be 14, 18 May. Eno meeting will be in Moscow, by the way. You know, we have uh hosted Eno meeting in Armenia. Who who knows that? Uh, yeah, great. <laughs> uh, Eno meeting is quite large, and this time it will be in Moscow in June, good time. And Southeast Europe will be in Timisoara in uh, June again. What, what you can do, uh, what preference do you, uh, what, 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 uh, what 
what is a good thing that you have and others might not have is me. <laughs> you can apply with your ideas, with your topics, with each and every thing you want. Um, and I will advise you. I will advise you because I'm, sometimes I'm based in Romania. So you can just find me on Facebook and write me Ban as such an idea and I want to participate in the private meeting or in a meeting, etc. And I'll guide you all through the process and will help you to understand how to fill the application form and how to be successful. Mm -hmm. So basically that I mean. means that uh, whatever field you are in, right, if it's interesting for the internet community and a lot of fields are interesting for mm -hmm. the internet community, you're gonna put some work into that, you're gonna uh, present it at one of these right meetings, the presentation is around 20 minutes with five minutes of questions and answers and then you get you know the rest of the uh, time completely paid right the flight is paid the accommodation is paid the entire stay is paid and you will get to know a lot of very interesting people so uh, I great highly companies, recommend that great companies great people and uh, fun we had yes. one question No, in general internet. Uh, everything that's uh, related to the internet mm -hmm. could be interesting. But I give you some examples. Yeah. Alex, just a moment. Um, I give you some examples. What we had uh, as a focus point in the last right meetings that was uh, uh, legal implications of the internet, right? I mean, you might have heard about the data protection uh, law, so the GDPR. So that means that the European Union right now is really stepping on the toes of uh, big companies that they should not use uh, personal data in the wrong way, right? Because, I mean, fundamentally there's a, there's a, a legislative difference between Europe and the US. In Europe, uh, personal data, so your data belongs to you, whereas in the US, this data that's been collected by big companies belongs to the company, right? And that is uh, a very big challenge, uh, not only for uh, the technology sector, but also for the lawyers that are... Yes. The only thing is to understand, it is not only for tech guys, it is also for uh, lawyers, it is also for know, even journalists, etc. If you find, because internet is everywhere now, and it can be very interesting also for our members if you have a good presentation, and good understanding what you want to do for our members and with our members. You, may, you might not be awarded a possibility to make a presentation, because it is a competitive process, but you can be awarded uh, with the possibility to be at this meeting and be represented there without presentation. So. And we want to encourage other fields than uh, technology, right? Sure. Because, I mean, imagine the right meeting is a meeting with 600 highly technical people and uh, we want to get new ideas uh, into this process. And I think it's a win-win situation for both parties. And if you see the list of participants at our right meetings or in our meetings, we have found it. So you can see that there are lawyers, there are economists, we have such cases. So, you're welcome to apply and we'll go to the next, uh, yeah, this is okay. Uh, we'll say it provides the basic assistance for successful candidates, it's about the right fellowship. It is uh, for all other people that are not academics, that are not students, and uh, that are not um, the academics and lecturers, etc. Each and every person can apply. So, oh, that's good. Perfect. All right. Uh, so, welcome to the second part of the presentation. And uh, I'm just remembering, or uh, help me to remember, Ellen, did we present that in the, in, on Saturday? No. Okay. All right, then. This is uh, a premiere for you, for you as well. Um, and I'm completely aware that um, I'm standing between the end of uh, the uh, your evening and, and uh, the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to do, what I suggest to you is uh, I'm going to quickly explain you what uh, you can expect uh, in these uh, topics and then I let you choose in which field we should uh, go in more depth and the other one that's less interesting for you we just skip. So the first one is internet uh, measurement data sets. Uh, this is something that I highly recommend because it's about data sets that help you to understand the internet. Um, the next one is RIPE-NCC measurement networks. So um, the RIPE-NCC um, runs uh, networks that collect certain data sets, right? 
This is something where I could say that we can go a little bit quicker through because uh, in the uh, long run you can all look that up if you're really interested. Then we have uh, big data at the right MCC. Um, also a thing that I would say if you are not specifically interested in that then uh, I'm gonna uh, go over that very quickly. Then the last one uh, and that is um, um, a system that allows you to get all of the data that we're gonna talk about in the first um, item. Um, this is also something that we can do rather quick. Examples of uh, data analytics, this is also something that I highly recommend because it's very interesting and then um, we have again an interactive session. Uh, will the internet fundamentally change in the future? Um, we mentioned blockchain. Um, this is something that I would reserve 10 minutes so that uh, we can talk about that a little bit. So, um, I would say that um, um, the first one we're gonna do, right? Uh, with the second one, um, who wants to hear about that in more details? Who is really interested about that to hear about uh, these things? Please, uh, okay, Alex. Um, about internet data analytics. Come again? About the main topic or the... Yes, about the, the, the subtopics, yeah. So right now, uh, internet measurement data sets we do definitely because uh, otherwise the other ones don't make sense. Uh, RIPE NCC measurement networks, RIS and RIPE ATLAS. Okay. Like okay. Yeah. 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 We we'll get there. The, uh, Patience. The the yes. Uh, this is something that. Yes. So uh, also in the light of that, we will have a, a presentation about RIPE Atlas. I, I keep the second part uh, short. Big data at the RIPE NCC. Is anyone really interested in how we're gonna deal with big data at the RIPE NCC? Yes. Okay. One person. I gonna mail you the slides if you're gonna. Have oh, well, I know his, uh, Okay, all right. You're going to take yeah, notes I will, of that? I will, no, I know it. I, uh, okay, perfect. perfect. Uh, well, we quickly go through the slides. If you're going to have a burning question, then um, just, you know, just get it somewhere to me. Then the RIPE NCC, RIPE uh, stat, also something we do uh, quickly. Then we're going to do uh, data analytics and then to the last part. Okay, cool. Perfect. So, um, in general, why are by the way, do we have a, um, a clicker? No, that's not a clicker. Because otherwise I always have to walk back and forth. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna do it from here. So, um, why is it important that we're gonna talk about uh, data, measurement data in general? And there's a simple reason, and that is that you can't improve anything if you don't know what it is about, right? I mean, this is a fun fundamental principle in engineering and I think in um, basically uh, every aspect in life. And uh, there is a simple method how to um, improve any system that you have and that is usually build, measure and then learn. And that is with internet measurement data, it's completely the same. As I said before, you can't improve what you can't measure. Could anyone give me an example of that? Think of your field. I mean, philosophy is, I, I think, a little bit a tricky one. But I think it's also related because, I mean, we have the, the different um, um, philosophers, right? I mean, there was Hegel who came after Marx. Before. Before. Oh, yeah, Marx was inheriting the knowledge from Hegel, right? All right, and that was also kind of a improvement. And I think you can measure that with the happiness of people. Is that a thing in? Uh, I, I don't think so, but uh, we can take into consideration the epistemological field in philosophy. Like in order uh, to know what is going on like in the world or in the area of the mm -hmm. universe, first of all, we should know what there is and measure it, and then to see what type of problems there are in order to be able to overcome the problems. Because Perfect. without knowing yeah. this... Exactly, really yeah. I mean, it's not possible that you measure the happiness of people. How should you do that? With IoT, we will be able to do that because we all have this um, thing in our body that measures how many endorphins we have in our body, right? Perfect. Uh, directly correlated with happiness. So, then, uh, 
there are three different uh, types of data sets when we are talking about internet measurement data sets. If you're gonna know what they are about, so if you grasp what they are about, you basically, yeah, you are very far in, in terms of data science related to internet data. Let's quickly go uh, through them. Um, the first one is registry data. Registry data is uh, something that is usually manually maintained and it's being collected to measure, right? It is administrative data. But um, Gabriel will talk about that uh, a bit more in details. The next data set is passive measurement data and that is observed to measure, right? Um, let me think of an example in the real world that um, is comparable to that. For example, right now I observe to measure, I observe how many people are in this room, right? Um, we're going to go into more details about that. Um, and then the other one is active measurement data. And for active measurement data, you need to, as the name implies, you need to actively do something to get the measurement results. And uh, that, for example, would mean that uh, if you want to uh, measure the speed, the average speed on a highway, you need to send a policeman there and he's standing with the radar to measure it, right? I mean, that analogy might be not completely accurate, but um, you get it in a way. So the important thing is that uh, you can't uh, just observe it. You really need to actively do something to, uh, to measure the data. And that gets us to the first one, which is the registry data. And Gabriel, as a software developer of the RIPE database, will give us the pleasure to introduce this data set. Uh, hello. First, I want to ask you one question. Anybody knows about GUIs here? GUIs database. One, two, one, one. Who is like, who? <laughs> <laughs> who is database of the RIPE and C and all the GUIs? So my colleagues, uh, Christian spoke a lot about, he showed you all the photos of the computers with numbers and ASNs in them, and also uh, Alex showed, uh, spoke about them. We, we in the WIS we, database saves all this data. It has multiple types of data for the customers, and we maintain that in our region, and other regions has their own databases. And via us, you can, know who owns this resource. So uh, there is some ISPs, I assume, in, uh, in here. There is also the university here. So everybody who has an IP is registered to someone. And when you search it, you can go online and search on our website. You can search that IP address, and you will find who owns it. And inside this resource, there is multiple types of data. One of them is the technical. So, for example, if a network engineer wants to speak with another network engineer of this IP, we, he will search it up and contact him via, via the technical. We have the abuse. The abuse is very important in case the IP address is doing something crazy, then you contact the owners of this IP address. And we have mul multiple use cases for it. And one of them is uh, Christian was explaining about the internet book, which is the routing, and that exists also in the database. So the right database is the one, one of the core uh, applications that other applications like RiveStart and other measurements comes to us to take the country information and more information of really who owns this uh, resource. So and I think you can give a really uh, concrete example when you said abuse. Uh, I mean, internet abuse um, could be hacking in a way because uh, all of these people that are on the internet, they are identified by an IP address. But as a policeman, you can't arrest the IP address, right? So you're going to arrest the person behind that. And this data is exactly giving this information. Or someone who is um, providing uh, okay, so software it, it that's provides the high copyright of, of, of who owns this uh, data set, uh, this IP addresses, mm. and via that you can contact the ISPs, and the ISPs has in each country uh, their own regulations, but that's, for example, Europol does uh, come to us and uh, to the WIS, and mm. everybody, you can do it yourself, 
if you like. I mean, you can also go to check what's your IP and then go check, oh, who owns this IP and how I'm here. And that will make sense for you how you connect to the router and to this. Kind of like a phone book of the internet, we call it. Do you have any questions about the OS database? No. <laughs> so, you can... Is there open source? Yeah, who is this open source? It's also... Can and collect all data for this? Or uh, no, you cannot collect the personal data. It's protected under the European uh, law. So, but you can query on personal data to a certain amount. And, but you can query unlimitedly to know the routing of each of those uh, data sets. But you have this data. Yes, we do have it, and the code is posted on GitHub. So if any of you is a Java software engineer who likes to help us, we, I mean, we accept any uh, pull requests or any ideas. Sorry, is yeah. it like Frutishers? Like secretary. What? You mean like a secretary? No, like the program where you can, uh, it's like connected to the DBpedia, or it's like the kind of the information that there is. I, we have an API that yeah. you can, many people build their own systems and they connect to us and grab information and one of them is the routers. So also routers come and say, okay, give me routing information and we give the routing information. And there is more of this type of things. So it's, it's also, it has a web interface. So you could write in our web interface any IP address and you will actually see who owns it and you will see if it's right or other kind of uh, Yes, Levon. Uh, do you keep it centralized or is it decentralized? Uh, the data of Europe is centralized. We do merge also from the rest of the LIRs and we keep all the data. So you can search VRI R in two, but you have to add only uh, slash R. So if you look at the interface, you can understand it. But you could also use RiveStar, which brings you all those information plus from where it is announced, which has a bit, uh, a bit more even deeper in the data. So uh, we are more, the, our LIR, the LIRs, the colleagues from the LIRs comes and man maintain their data in the voice. And there is multiple applications, one of them arrives start to grab data from us and there is also, the Krishna will speak about those data sources, but we are more like a core for our clients. And yes, it is a simple, uh, centralized. And when, let's say, if uh, a company or two companies in Armenia merge together and they want to take the IPs to one of those companies, they contact us and then the right database will merge them and make them on the one IP, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, one LIR, sorry. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. I mean, this data set um, is, uh, I mean, from a data science perspective, so because I work in R&D, um, very interesting because it is the only record that shows how many resources, and we are talking about IP addresses and uh, these ASMs numbers, are being used in a country. And I mean, just think about that. Um, if, um, and that makes it, I think, um, very unique as well. Um, here we have some examples, um, that is, uh, that's the country list for Georgia. So um, there is an interface, I'm going to show you where you can find it, but um, right now, just uh, what you're going to see on this uh, uh, screenshot is all the ASNs that are registered in Georgia. And who do you think is very interested in that? Programmers? The government. Exactly, the government. Because um, uh, that was two years ago, I met uh, some people from um, the government, uh, the cyber security department. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you which country, but um, they were very delighted to see um, this, uh, this data, because finally they know what they have to monitor, right? Um, sometimes it's very trivial, but uh, if you don't have this data, you can't do anything, right? Um, you want to create laws and that makes it very specific that uh, uh, legislation and uh, technology need to work together because otherwise it's just chaos, right? There are some countries in which uh, this coordination between technology and, and law is just not there and they can't do anything about that, right? So um, 
uh, content like child pornography is being hosted in countries where we don't have any, well we as the internet community, we have uh, only small ways to, to change that and, and take that down, right? And um, I think a lot of people in the internet community are very busy to change uh, this situation, but of course it requires also a stable government in a way. Okay, then let's go to the um, next uh, data set, um, which is the passive uh, measurement data set. And uh, you remember when we had this, uh, you know, this drawing with the numbers and these routing tables, and what the um, routing data, the BGB routing data basically is, um, all these phone books collected together. Because I, I told you before that if you're a uh, node number one and uh, a certain machine is not in this book, you can't reach it, right? I mean, uh, as an example, Netflix is not there. So you're at home, you try to go to Netflix, and if it's not in this book, then you can't reach it, right? This is a problem. And that's why a lot of people, so the internet service provider, is very uh, busy of keeping this as up-to-date as possible, right? And uh, to measure that, we have the routing data. And what we, uh, the way we're going to measure it, we're going to collect uh, these routing tables from as many people that provide this data to us. And I'm going to show you some ap applications that we can do based on this data. Um, what is important uh, is that uh, in this data you would see if a cable connection between two machines just breaks. Then you would see a change in the in the routing table. So right now we have, a, we have a broken cable between five and four. That means that all the connections that go to, uh, from five to four, well, that was before here, right? Two, five, four, two, five, two, five, will, and that is the characteristic of the internet, that it will reconfigure itself. Um, it will change that the data flows this way, right? And, um, the routing protocol just makes sure that that will happen, right? Um, so you, nobody has to do manually something about that. But the importance is that this would be reflected in a routing table. So uh, imagine that you have uh, one month ago, this cable was still active. Then you have in the routing data, um, not the, the line that goes via seven, right? But as soon as this cable break, breaks, then the, the data in the routing table would reflect that, and then you're going to see all the data that flows from five to three, that that that, that goes over seven. Okay, and uh, the PGB routing data? Really? Okay, all right. We're going to make a mark. No, sure. <laughs> see you. Um, so the routing data is all the these phone books collected together. And you can also visualize that. And that, then you would see something like that. And uh, let me explain that. So in the middle is the, let's assume it's Facebook or uh, Netflix. Then um, Netflix is connected to everyone else on the internet. And if you're going to have access to uh, Netflix, then you're sitting at one of these uh, blue dots. And um, if you're not sitting at one of these blue dots, you don't have access to Netflix. And this is a very important uh, uh, thing to know, right? Because it enables you to uh, draw uh, results um, from this routing data. And um, there are a couple of uh, applications that were enabled with that. Then let's quickly talk about uh, active measurement data. Um, in comparison to the passive measurement data, I said before, what do we have to do? Anyone? It's basically in the name. So it's a super easy question for, what is that? Okay, for this one. You have to? Measure. Yeah, all it's all measurement data. All yeah, measure. yeah, 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 but more. I mean, this <laughs> passive measurement data is also collect and measure. But what? Observe. Serve it. Observe. Obs no, that's, that was passive measurement data. What do we have to do with oh, this I one? Asking about Hold on. Yeah, was that what you wanted to say? Uh, yes. Uh, in, uh, during the oh, well, hold on, before you answer, um, 
because I'm willing to give out two. <laughs> so, uh, was that what you wanted to say? I spoke about uh, passive measurement, but now ah. I understand that you are asking about active ones. And what would you, what your answer be? For active ones? Yeah. Uh, active one, there should be kind of like if in the case of uh, passive measurement, you just collect the data or just observe it. In the case of active measurement, you should do kind of actions. Or Perfect. That's enough. Okay, perfect. Can I try? Perfect, good. Wonderful. So, um, I draw um, this graph there, and uh, what we have there is the, situa the following situation. Between 1 and 2, there is a broken cable, and between 6 and 5, there is uh, this very long cable, right? And uh, what do we want to do? We want to do active measurements, so we have to set an action. Let's say that um, every hour we want to send data from number 4 to 1 and 6. Um, I think you can already uh, assume what will happen. These are the results. So basically it says um, the data that we get out of that or the information or knowledge is that um, the line between 4 and 5 works fine. The line between 5 and six takes ages because it's a very long one, right? Do we have any uh, questions there? Yes, somebody was asking something. Yeah, I think I heard something. <laughs> no? Is, is that clear so far? Okay, perfect. I liked when you nod uh, synchronously. Anyway, um, then we have five and two. 5 and 2 is also okay, and then the line between 2 and 1 is not working, right? This is the thing that um, you get out of active measurement data. Uh, what would we uh, observe? So, just going back two slides, what was something that we also observed in passive me measurement data? Was it this one or this one? Or both? Yeah, so the broken connection, yeah. So, um, this is a, I don't know what that is for. <laughs> oh, you are collecting yeah. it already. Yeah. So, uh, it is important that each of these data sets can solve a different problem, right? The routing data could tell me that the line between one and two is broken, right? So, um, again, if you are not sitting in one of these blue dots, then you don't have connection to uh, Netflix. Whereas, if you're going to sit on one of these blue dots, you have connection to Netflix, but then there could be another problem. It could be something like that. So that means that the data uh, flows very slowly. So you can't watch, you can't enjoy the movie, right? So this, uh, that's why we have active measurement data, to solve different problems. Um, there are different examples of uh, active measurement data. Just, you know, we're not going to go into details. And uh, there's an inherent problem with active measurement data because you constantly have to do it. If you miss the chance to do something like that, then uh, it's gone, it's over. With passive measurement data, we have a very good uh, picture of what's going on on the internet. So we know what's up and what's not. But um, for example, um, you represent Netflix and someone does a DDoS against Netflix and I did not measure uh, the connection to you every you know, X every hour or so, and something happened, but I didn't measure that, then I have no chance to see what's going on. So that's also important. We need to have a lot of um, actions on the internet. Later on, when we quickly talk about Atlas, I show you um, the impact, what that means for us running these networks. Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it overhelp the system? Yeah, it's basically a DDoS. You're absolutely right. Um, the way we're going to uh, do active measurements is still uh, small enough uh, so that we are not affecting the system too much. But you're absolutely right. When you do active measurements, you influence the system. And the worst thing of active measurement is this one, broadband data. So um, I guess uh, you have uh, internet connection at home and uh, your internet service provider tells you you buy uh, internet with 20 megabits per second, right? I mean, just a number, right? 
And you don't believe them, right? Because uh, you said, no, our internet is slow, uh, I pay a little bit more. And then they give you 40 megabits per second. And you think like, no, there is not really a change, right? Then you could do a, a broadband check um, where you're gonna test what is the speed between me and the world. And then you could get the result if it's what the internet service provider says or if it's not like that, right? But on the other side, if you're gonna run a broadband test, then you're trying to saturate, you know, full, uh, fill up the, your broadband, and then every other connection that you do during that time will be super slow, right? So there is a bit of a trade-off, because on the other side, you also want to know it. Um, and for the people that are uh, studying uh, physics, it's like um, uh, the Heisenberg problem, right? I mean, you can't measure the location of a particle because you influence the system at the same time, right? But we, do we have any physics here? Doesn't matter. Um, we have one here, right? No? Physics, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to give you another example. Let me see what's the next one. Okay, the next one is the measurement network. Um, maybe it helps if, we, if we're going to go back to this one. Um, in 2012, you remember that there was the Arab Spring. Yeah? And um, the first country that uh, it... Um, uh, escalated was uh, Libya, right? Imagine that's Libya and that's uh, Egypt. Um, if you are a dictator, you're in control of the communication systems. Now, if you have um, the opposition, so the people that don't like you, right? Um, they have no communication systems, but they could use the internet, and they did use that, right? They used Facebook uh, and WhatsApp to organize uh, you know, demonstrations and things like that. And um, the uh, dictator at that time uh, was Gaddafi. Yeah. And what he did, because he controls the, uh, the only line that goes to the outside from the internet, what he did was exactly that one. So um, because he did that in that way, that really showed up on the, in, in the routing data. So all the resources that, remember, the registry data, belongs to uh, Libya, they suddenly disappeared from the routing table. And then it was completely obvious that he was doing something very dodgy, right? And um, I can show you later on a, a tool where you can also see how the uh, routing table for a country uh, inf uh, changes over time. But the interesting point right now is completely a different one. Here we have Egypt. And um, it was half a year later that um, the conflict swept over to Egypt and Mubarak at that time, um, he had the same problem as Gaddafi. But what he did was, and I mean, if it would, be, would not be that sad, you could contribute that he was smarter, um, he did something like that. That means that um, on the routing table, everything is fine. We couldn't monitor that, that there is something wrong, right? Um, and hence, we didn't report it to anyone, right? And, but the problem was that what he did, he uh, kind of the cable that goes to the outside, he kind of uh, throttled the, the bandwidth. So basically, that no, almost no data can uh, flow through, right? It's the same effect, but um, very difficult to, to monitor, right? For that, you would have to have active measurement data which is very difficult to say like, hey, right now in Egypt there's a problem with the internet. Because for that, you would have to set actions. You would have to run these measurements to every uh, network in Egypt, and then it's coming back to the registry data, right? So you need to combine a lot of knowledge to uh, really come to the conclusion, right now someone is um, changing the internet in a country, right? Anyway. Okay, let's uh, continue with, uh, so we do that very quickly because, uh, yeah, we're still in time. Um, we run uh, at the RIPE NCC, um, so um, Vahan already explained that, that uh, no, Alex, Alex explained that um, we, uh, as the RIPE NCC, we are not only a registry. Our members decided that, hey guys, it's nice that you run the registry, but we also want you to uh, take 
more part in the development of the Internet. Our mission statement is that we do something for the good of the Internet. So we're going to help to develop the Internet. And in this role, we're going to run two measurement networks that collect exactly these two data sets that I described before. I mean, we already have the, uh, the registry data. We have RIS uh, for the passive measurement data. We have RIPE Atlas for the active measurement data. Um, RIS is very simple to uh, collect. What we're going to have is we have, um, at the moment, I think it's, it's 20, 20 uh, servers all over the, 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 the globe and they are usually at internet service providers, uh, at IXPs, so where a lot of internet service providers come together, and we ask them, hey guys, can you please share your routing table with us? So the, the book, right? And they did it. So we have more than uh, 160, if, you, if full table doesn't say anything to you, it doesn't matter, but we have a lot of people that are um, sharing their view on the internet with us. And this helped us to monitor situations like in Libya. Because uh, it can be that one internet service provider doesn't have all the information, right? But as soon as 160 internet service providers don't see all the uh, networks in Egypt or in, in Libya being on the internet anymore, then it's for sure, then we can be sure for sure, and also any government we're going to share this information with, they can also be sure that there's something going on, right? Data science has a lot uh, to do with, with trust, right? So how much do you trust the data? It's about data quality. What you're going to see here is RIPE Atlas. And um, I told you before that the problem with active measurement data is that if you don't do this action um, in time, then you lose the chance to observe it, right? All of these small dots are uh, measurement devices that we distributed uh, to the internet community. And uh, recently we celebrated more than 10,000 active devices all over the internet and these devices can do a couple of measurements. I'm not going into the details uh, of these measurements um, because I think right now it's not too important. Um, this network has uh, more than 10,000 uh, probes connected and um, we have almost 18,000 measurements, parallel measurements running, right? This is against the problem that if we miss to measure something, then uh, it's gone, this chance. This number is still very low, because imagine what I said before, we have more than 52,000 networks on the internet, but we are run running only uh, almost 18,000 uh, measurements um, at a time, right? So that means there is a huge chunk of the internet that we just don't see, right? Um, so everyone who uses this data also doesn't see this. So it's important that we're going to grow this network. And we are very active uh, in doing that. And if you uh, wonder how these devices look like, uh, this is an example of um, how one of these probes look like. And we're going to rely on uh, volunteers to connect that to the internet. Um, so this is about big data and um, I'm going to skip through that. That's uh, not so important, I think, right now. Um, to have access to this data, because, I mean, it's one thing to collect this data, but um, also to improve the internet and allow um, everyone to take uh, benefit and advantage of this data, we have RIS, uh, we have RIPESTAT. And RIPESTAT is the open data platform of uh, the RIPENCC. And uh, we provide not only data to the registry or the RIS or ATLAS, there are a couple of other data sets as well. So we have um, from MLAB, these are broadband checks, we have speed checker, we have geolocation data. Geolocation data is a very interesting data set. It sounds very simple, but it is, in practice, it is not simple at all. So you have an IP address and you want to know where that's being used. This is a very simple mapping, but to get that right is, I would say, it is impossible to absolutely get it right, but even to get it usable and accurate is also very difficult. If you're going to come up with a solution how to create a data set that's accurate, um, I guess you can easily sell that and uh, be super rich. 
Then uh, we have blacklist data. Um, yeah, that's uh, I think not so important. Um, ripe study in itself is built in layers. I think that's also not too important right now. Um, if you're going to go to stat.ripe.net, then you would see something like that. And um, what you could do is you could enter, so this is the input um, form, you can enter an IP address, an ASN, a domain name, so right, what we already went through, and then you get additional information uh, on that. Um, it's definitely outside of the scope of this workshop to go through all the different data sets that you would get in return. But uh, if you have a, a moment to, um, to look it up, then yeah, please be my guest. Um, this might be interesting to see how many people are using that. 2010, we started with RIPESTAT and we had per day around 10,000 requests. And um, the most recent number is that per day we get more than 55 million requests a day. And that's coming from more than 1.5 million uh, users. This is an example if you're going to look up an um, IP range. Here you would see which ASN is announcing that IP range. You're going to see the geolocation of that. So that IP range is predominantly used in uh, Amsterdam. Then we also have registry information. Gabriel talked about that. Uh, the widget API, I'm not going into details about that. Um, it is, um, I, so in a nutshell, it is uh, a user interface to all this data. And we already saw the, the mapping of um, how these networks are connected. So there is a tool where you can enter IP address and then you exactly see how it's being interconnected on the internet. Um, this is uh, something that might be more difficult to uh, understand, but I just put it there because of the following one. Um, let me just quickly uh, explain what the colors mean. The colors, they mean that um, if your uh, IP space is being seen by a lot of these 160 peers, right? So if your IP space is in a lot of these routing tables, then it's green. If you're in less of these routing tables, then it's more to the red, right? So in essence, it would mean that um, for that time in 2012, uh, everything from, each, uh, from Libya was red right, for a short period of time. And um, we have someone in the community who is very geeky, and what he did is, uh, so he controls uh, certain IP addresses. He played around with, uh, oh, they are announced on the internet, so basically they are seen in the routing tables, or they are not seen in the routing tables. If you're an operator of IP space, then you can easily do that. And he was drawing the neon cat, so um, that was rather funny and um, maybe also a waste of IPv4 space. Because we already talked about that, IPv4 space is running out. He was using IPv4 space for that, um, to draw that. And I mean, imagine that uh, there is a customer behind uh, one of these IP addresses during the time when, uh, you know, after their, their, their eyes are drawn, there's no internet, right? So I'm pretty sure there is no customer behind. He was just playing around with that. Okay, um, abuse, we talked about that. So um, police, uh, Europol, Interpol, they constantly come to us and want to have information who owns what and... Um, okay, this is the country statistics. So what we did, we just combined uh, what we see in the registry. So we're going to see like, oh, all these IP addresses belong to Armenia. Then what we're going to do is we're going to count how many IP addresses are being used in Armenia and that's what you're going to see there. The blue one is, I guess you know that, right? We talked about that IPv4 and IPv6, right? And it basically means this is the development of IPv6 prefixes in Armenia. The green one is um, IPv6 and the blue one is IPv4. Um, from this picture, quick interpretation, that tells me already IPv6 is not relevant in Armenia. Armenia is not alone with that. We have many countries who you know, just give a shit about. But it's still 61% in, the, in comparison with other countries. So it's still high. I, I don't mean it there, but they mm -hmm. are announcing it in 61% uh, of mm -hmm. our colleagues here are yeah. announcing IPv6. So you're doing well. Our Armenia is doing well. well and if you go to Rapmas, by the way, Armenia is also one of the leaders. Perfect. If you go to Perfect. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, then you just have to work to get the, the green line a little bit higher and the blue line a little bit lower. Yes? Yeah, a couple of explanations. Um, how technical are you? Physics, Physics. okay, all right. So, um, uh, in 2012, um, the world um, realized that we are running out of IPv4 addresses. Then, um, depending on how quick or not quick a country responds to that, we're gonna see that you know, everyone panics, right? Ah, we need IPv4 addresses, we need IPv4 addresses, and they are running to the registry to us to get IPv4 addresses. You can see that uh, there in a way. So you can see that a huge increase in there. And then suddenly it dropped. Um, we as the registry, um, we thought about, okay, if we're gonna give out the last IPv4 space, then uh, in a month or two, we don't have anything left. And we decided, well, not we, as Alex said, um, the internet community decided that let's give companies that are not yet on the market a chance to use and participate on the internet. So what they did is, uh, the RIPE NCC and all other RARs, they uh, came up with policies and said like, if someone wants to get IPv4 address space, then we are not giving them a huge chunk of uh, IP addresses, but we can give everyone a little bit one, right? And this is what you're gonna see uh, right now there. So the, the curve is slower um, because we give out chunks of uh, 1,000 IP addresses to everyone who registers. So we make it much slower for someone to accumulate IP4 addresses. And um, on, the, on the other side, you also see that there are more and more companies registering. So that's why you still see an uptake on that. And from an economic point of view, it's very interesting because um, you know what happens to scarce resources, right? I mean, just look at oil. Oil is not, we don't have a lot of oil. So what happens? The price of oil goes up, right? Same with uh, IPv4 addresses. So at around that time, a second market developed. So companies that have IPv4 addresses, they said like, hey guys, we're gonna sell it. And uh, we have a couple of examples of people that uh, earned a lot of money by selling IPv4 addresses. And I give you a, um, a kind of an idea of how much that is. At this moment, one IP address is being sold for 12 euros a piece, right? I mean, kind of in this area, right? And now imagine that um, you would have you know, basically in those days when you can get a lot of IP addresses, if you would accumulate them, right? And then uh, suddenly over here, you're gonna sell them, right? I mean, you, it's like Bitcoin, right? Um, maybe as, um, has anyone Bitcoins? No, you have Bitcoins. I hope you already sold it. No, okay, well, then I hope you don't have too much. All right. Um, is it late? Okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, then quickly about the examples of uh, data analytics. So, um, with uh, this huge amount of data that we have, with artificial intelligence and with big data and machine learning, we could uh, create, uh, first of all, the status of IPv4 in countries. And what you're gonna see there is, uh, this line is internet uses uh, per IP address. So how many people are sharing an IP address? And on the uh, vertical um, axis, you're gonna see the population growth, right? And right now you can easily see that all the countries, so all of these dots, they represent countries. Countries in this uh, uh, um, quarter, they have a problem because they already have a lot of people using one IP address and then their population growth. And I think there was a two day uh, article in uh, a magazine, I don't remember, that uh, Eastern European countries, for example, they have a shrinking, they, they are leading with a shrinking population. So I would assume that they are uh, either here or here, right? Um, any questions to that? Oh, okay. Down there, yeah, development of IPv6, that's, um, you have seen so many graphs. Um, another thing that we could tell based on the data is which country influenced IPv6 positively per year 
and which country influenced it negatively. And there are a lot of surprises in there. So first of all, in 2070, you see Germany there. And there you have Costa Rica. That already tells us that uh, it's not leading economies that you know, are good with IPv6, right? And um, that is very interesting for the governments, again, uh, to know. On the other side, the red ones, they should um, think about their strategies. Um, this is, again, population growth and a number of internet users. And this is the last one before we're going to go into the discussion. Um, this is a, a tool that we developed, um, which is, I mean, a lot of governments, they are burning to see that. We just, on Friday, we had a, um, a presentation in uh, Tbilisi, uh, and uh, representatives of the government were there, and they were super happy to see that. Um, this is a, a map that shows how the data flows within a country. Let me explain that. We have these probes distributed, right? In Armenia, we have a certain amount of probes, and what we're going to do, uh, we let one probe send a, a, a data to another probe in the same country. What you'd, would you assume? One probe is in the country, and the other probe is in your country. Then we would assume that the data stays within the country. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So what you, what you would assume? Yes. Would it stay in the same country or not? And this, this could go for banking also, because if you're doing something with internet banking, you, have, you think, okay, I'm going to the Armenian bank, I, am I on the same country or am I going to Russia and coming back to Armenia? Mm. So uh, what was the question, actually? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, are, we are asking, uh, what, uh, what do they assume? If it is going outside the country? Yeah, or yeah okay, all right. If okay. it's going outside the country, it, it, no, no, it, well, it should stay in the country, right? It should, yeah. but <laughs> Okay, so first of all, uh, this is based on trace routes. Um, and theoretically, there is a high chance that the way that uh, data travels is a little bit different, right? So uh, it is not ground truth. There is room for uh, interpretation. And... Uh, Actually, I, I removed the special effect because uh, the special effect was that there is a burning wall of fire, and then I realized that these special effects in uh, PowerPoint are not the best ones. So, what we're going to see there is on the left one uh, IPv4, on the right one IPv6. Um, in many countries, you don't see anything for IPv6, but we see at least a little bit for uh, Armenia, so that is good. Then, uh, Alex is coming, and I wonder why. Yeah, suspicious. So, here we have um, Armenia, okay? And um, again, the source and the destination of these data packages are in Armenia. Um, but what we see is that uh, the IP addresses that are found on that way are in uh, Frankfurt, for example, then we have Sofia, I think that's uh, Vienna, that's the Vienna Internet Exchange. So that means that, uh, and right now I'm not talking about data that, you know, is connecting to Facebook in the US or something like that. This is data that you're going to send within the country. Um, so for politicians, um, no, for the engineers in the country, um, that is bad because uh, it is not efficient. Um, because it takes much longer to, you know, to send the data first to Europe and then back, if we too uh, in interchange data, right? Then on the other side, sending the data over there is not cheap because you have to pay for um, the data being sent. And then especially interesting for the government is that um, it's uh, national security, right? Because as a government, um, you can decide what's happening within a country. You can basically say, okay, internet service provider, they need to keep a log when when you're on the internet, and you, they should do it for two months or something like that, right? Um, but as soon as the data goes outside of the country, they have no chance to know what's happening with this data, right? Um, it could theoretically be that uh, the, you know, the FBI uh, controls that data point, and they're going to collect a lot of data. So they suddenly know what's happening within the country, right? That is definitely not good. Okay, and uh, then I think um, we're at the end. Future Outlook, forget about that. 
um, interactive yeah. session. Right now, we're going to come to um, the. Yes, yeah. uh, we have guest speakers, and you want to con uh, want to add something? Yeah, yeah, just a just couple of words. Couple of words? Yep. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Christian told that we are we, we do care about uh, this probe distribution and it given the increasing the number of probes. And to be honest, that's very simple. And you personally, you. Uh, who are interested in, you know, the, the internet analytics or something, uh, can help uh, both whole internet community and your country, because uh, the hosting of probe is a very simple thing. You saw uh, the device; it's a very simple device with Ethernet cable and USB for uh, for power. USB is just for power, and you can get this probe absolutely for free, free of charge. For advances uh, from, from right CC by usual post service, uh, you can ask. Even if you can get it from me. Yeah, no, you, you can ask Varan, he will provide you with the probe or with the uh, URL where you can order the probe. Very simple, you just plug it in and that's it. And after that, you can participate in this uh, in the research because. Costing a probe gives you so-called credits, and you spend those credits to create your own research at any of ten thousand probes in the world. So you can participate. You it's very it, simple, right? really simple. It's free of charge. So please uh, join the team. Yeah. Yeah. So we have later on a presentation about uh, Atlas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Perfect. Good. So then um, let's uh, run into it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Let's run into the um, interactive session. So, how will the internet change our lives in the future? And to to start with that and give you an idea, we have the blockchain, right? We talked a little bit about the blockchain. We have Internet of Things. We talked about Internet of Things. We have uh, this represents artificial intelligence. Um, this is something, um, the last uh, image is representing local caches. And uh, if you dare to go into a bit more technical discussion, then let me explain you what that means. So um, you know that uh, Facebook, um, YouTube, they produce most of the data that's being sent around on the internet, right? And um, uh, Google, Facebook know that, right? So um, what they do as a strategy right now is that uh, they are not sitting in the US and you need to connect from Armenia to the US uh, to get the data. But what they are using is local caches, right? So they create a kind of complex system that they're going to put um, into Armenia. So whenever you contact uh, Facebook, then you don't have to send data to the US and back but you stay uh, in the country, right? I mean, they already got it that uh, it's not efficient if you're going to send data outside of the country. Uh, that has some implications that, um, uh, for example, in, uh, on Friday, we shared some images um, from the workshop and I was on a VPN. A VPN is nothing else than uh, it hides your uh, connection on the local uh, internet and it will connect to a, a remote location and then you're going to internet, uh, access the internet from there, right? It can be used for, to bypass geo-blocking or something like that, right? And uh, what happened was that um, someone was putting images on Facebook uh, from uh, Tbilisi and I tried to download them. And it took a long, long time. And that was because I was, um, I was using a different local cache, right? I mean, ages. It took uh, it took longer than for someone who was directly connected on the on the local network, and that is also not too important. But what's important is that um, the internet became uh, popular because it was this interconnection between all these networks, right? Because everyone was sharing information, and the threat theoretically could be that right now, if these local caches are in your network, that the connections to the outside of your network are not that necessary anymore. 
So that means that nobody is paying for that. And that means that uh, that's a bit related also with net neutrality. You might have heard about that. That uh, in the long run, let's say in 20 years, that if you're going to go to Google or Facebook, it's super fast. But as soon as you want to go to Wikipedia, it's super slow, right? That is a, a threat that um, at least the internet community is right now fighting against that. Um, at the moment, it looks a bit like that, uh, you know, that the, uh, the internet organizations, they, they put uh, undersea cables between the continents to connect everything, right? And uh, since a, a couple of time, so since uh, a few years, it's not a telecom operator anymore that's lying, laying out new cables. It's Facebook and Google. And that's already telling us something, right? So anyway, let's uh, start with a positive outlook into uh, how the internet will change our, uh, our future. I'm sorry, can Google or these large companies have separate cables? Or yeah, yeah, they do. They do, yeah. Yeah, they have the money for that, right? Because um, that's a, a very business-oriented uh, question. So uh, imagine that Facebook started out in the US. And um, if you as a customer of Facebook um, want to connect to them, then the question is, who is paying for the internet con connectivity in between, right? I mean, for the last mile, it's your internet service provider because you pay for that, right? But there is also the discussion that um, the internet service providers, they say like, hey, um, everyone is using Google, Facebook, YouTube. Nobody is giving me money for that, right? So let's see how we uh, can change that, right? Because these uh, internet organizations like Facebook, Google, the big ones, they are very smart. They, um, they know that uh, people use it because of the content, right? And that is, I think, also a problem for the, uh, uh, for the mobile operators. Because um, the mobile operators, who is creating the mobile phones? It's not the mobile operator, right? It's, um, it's uh, um, Apple, it's, you know, Samsung and that. Who is creating the reason why you have a smartphone? Why do you have a smartphone? Content makers. Exactly. So, I mean, in the long run, why do you, use, why do you pay your, uh, internet, uh, your mobile provider? Because there are more and more of these uh, Wi-Fi networks, right? If you're in a, in a city that's it's very dense, where a lot of uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots are, you don't need your uh, you don't need t telecom or a B line or something like that. So why do you why do you have to pay them? So that means that in the long run you will not pay them anymore, and then they will die, right? And the same thing could happen with these uh, interconnections between um, and and that's the the problem in a way, right? So I think at this moment we are in very interesting times. What will happen in the future with the internet? Also net neutrality is a very interesting one. So uh, what do you think? Um, I mean, I would like to pick up the, 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 the question about uh, does technology provide us with more time or with less time? What do you think about that? I think it takes more time. Okay, why, why is that? Okay, well, I mean, we would, uh, I would argue that um, if you have... You have some operations that you would make fast, but also you spend a lot of time in the Facebook store. Okay, that means that... Uh, you, are, you are speed in arranging something in your uh, everyday life, mm -hmm. but when you have free time, you don't need to do that. So basically... It's like I'm on the Facebook store, yes, it's yeah. some kind of it helps you, yeah. but in the other time, it uh, takes your free time Okay, if, if, if I'm going to summarize uh, that, that would mean that technology helps us to save time, right? Because you said you can do things faster, but on the other side, we also do more, and that's why we have less time, in a way, right? Um, what do you think about that? We have a lot of time, but we don't understand that we don't use this time for other routines. We always spend our time on this thing. Is it a good or a bad thing? Okay. I just, uh, I just looking on Facebook, but I don't learn something or something. I just looking for uh, photos in Instagram. Yeah. What does it give to me? 
it's called procrastination, right? <laughs> uh, so um, the thing is that um, we will have to learn more and more in the future. Um, because the, the economies, they require that, right? Um, 40 years ago, if you didn't study, okay, that was fine. Meanwhile, you have to study to be able to work. What we also see is, and that uh, goes a bit uh, towards machine learning, is that uh, um, the barrier of you finding a job um, increases um, with the more knowledge you have, right? The more knowledge you have, you're safer to not lose your job. Um, artificial intelligence right now is, is increasing that uh, bar, right? So that means over the next few years we will see more and more jobs being replaced by robots. Um, and if the development goes on like now, then um, this might be a wild uh, guess, but in 30 years we might not be required to work anymore because a machine can do it better than we do. But this is a quite a negative outlook, right? Give me something positive. How does the internet change our lives in a positive way? So mm -hmm. we can uh, do better and the result is better. Okay, this, uh, have you seen the, uh, what is it, the Van Gogh um, project where uh, a machine was taking a random picture, so you take a picture, then you put it into that machine and then it creates an image that looks like if Van Gogh would have drawn it. Um, and I, I don't know the exact name, but there are a couple of these projects and um, at this moment, um, they, had, they made a test between uh, if human beings can uh, distinguish the one that was created by a computer and one that was created by the real artist, and you can assume that that uh, was not uh, clear-cut, right? So I would say that maybe we leave the creative part also to the computer. I think that in 30 years we all have, you know, we can choose if we want to work or not, but we don't have to, right? Yes? Mm -hmm. What should we do then? <laughs> and I think, enjoy life. enjoy life, okay. I think that in the future when um, we solve the energy crisis, right, that will come with solar panels or something similar, right? Because we produce solar panels, at a, a certain moment we have enough solar panels that there is enough energy that we don't need to care about that. And then energy will be for free and then we're going to add artificial intelligence and then we can be really lazy. And then I think it's the time of philosophy. Because you need to find a reason why you, you know, stay alive. Time of procrastination. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You learn how to scroll. Oh, you have nothing to do? Use that. A new app. No, uh, something I think we're going to con conclude it because it's already quite late. And that means that um, we're going to go to the last slide, which is questions and answers. Um, well, if you're going to have any questions, then please contact me. Uh, if you have also any answers, you can also contact me. Yes, if you're going to have answers, especially if you have answers, then please contact me. And uh, then we're going to conclude it. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, the patience that you brought up to still stay here. Um, we lost, I think, 40%, um, which is still a good ratio. And then we have two presentations still up. Yep. And yeah, let's just do that. Thank you very much.